to the kill count, where we tally up the victims in all our favorite horror movies. I'm James A. Janice, and today we're looking at Escape Room, released in 2019. Escape Room's premise and title comes from the relatively recent fad of room-sized puzzles you have to escape within a certain time limit. Chelsea and I are enormous fans of puzzles in general, and escape rooms in particular, and I will say this movie does a great job replicating the experience of looking for clues and figuring out codes. Only here, if you don't figure it out in time, it's not your pride you lose, but your life. Escape Room is a sleek film with exceptional production design. Room after room features phenomenal detailing and creative dangers for the characters to avoid. The characters themselves are fine for the most part, distinct at the very least. Some of them are played by very likable actors, which in my mind makes up for the weaker and shallower ones. And while the overall plot isn't exactly anything groundbreaking, the clue searching sections are just smart enough to keep you from feeling like you're being talked down to. Overall, it's a fun movie. Not perfect, but not bad. If you can get past the first 20 minutes, there is a solid hour in the middle before an ending that, in my opinion, is a bit muddled and meh. Here, you start looking for numbers or symbols, and I'll start looking for bodies, because it's time for the kills. The movie begins in a fancy study. Damn, this place is picture perfect. I don't think anything could disrupt the tranquility of- And a dude just fell through the ceiling. He frantically yammers about clues and numbers while the room starts to shrink around him. He gets all sorts of fucked up trying to figure out what to do, but since there's no scout's guide to follow, the walls close in on him before he can escape. We jump to three days prior so we can meet all of our protagonists. Main girl Zoe Davis is a smart but timid quantum science college student. Jason Walker is a super alpha, super aggro stock trader, and Ben Miller, that guy from the cold open, is stuck at a dead-end job with a drinking problem. Like I mentioned, this first act is definitely the film's weakest, with all these clunky character introductions and a pretty generic tone. The three of them each receive a mysterious black puzzle box that encourages them to open new doors. Through brain power, YouTube tutorials, and violent desperation, they each unlock the prize, an entry voucher to the Minos escape room with potential prize money of $10,000. Not a bad room escape and raid. These three aren't the only ones invited to Minos, named after the Greek mythological figure who would trap people in the Minotaur's labyrinth. Joining them for the great escape, first is Amanda Harper, played by Deborah Ann Wall, who was in True Blood and Daredevil, and who's also a big D&D player. Not only was she Dungeon Master in Geek and Sundry's Relics and Rarities, but she's also DM games for Deadmeat's very own Zorin Gavoyage. Her cell phone is confiscated in the Minos lobby. Can't be twittering pictures of the puzzles. But another player, Danny Khan, is an expert room escaper who knows the ropes enough to sneak in a second. The two of them get to the waiting room where we meet our sixth and final puzzler, Mike Nolan. He's played by Tyler Labine, who you'll recognize as Dale from the previously covered Tucker and Dale vs. Evil. A frosty receptionist tells Amanda to sit down and wait, as the players show us how some of them are pretty thinly sketched in caricatures. Can you still play video games? No. Nah, man, unfortunately I can't. So, I just have sex with adult women. Yeah, that interaction had me concerned about the rest of the movie, but luckily, the other characters are enjoyable, and things start getting better right about now. Ben tries to go outside for a cigarette, but inadvertently kicks things off by exposing their first puzzle. It, it looks like an oven dial, which means it's probably a combination lock. Danny, who's done 93 escape rooms, tells the others to start looking for clues. They do, and we see that some of the things they find have a certain disquieting effect on them. Okay. Amanda notes that all the magazines there are addressed to the same person. Uh, Dr. Wu Tan Yu? Oh, Wu Tan Yu? He ain't nothing to fuck with. They find what they're looking for in a Bradbury book, but when Zoe dials it in, it doesn't open the door. It instead turns on an electric heater in the ceiling. Better find more clues, y'all. This place about to be sweat city. It's really throwing off some heat. Yeah, it's warm. <laughs> Amanda's not a fan of the rise in temperature and tries to ask the receptionist for a clue, but the unseen employee has a single robotic response to the request. Please have a seat. Someone will be with you shortly. Uh. As the room continues preheating with coils wrapped around pillars, Zoe finds another key that they can use. With it, they unlock the glass divider to reveal a mannequin receptionist who kind of looks like Kristen Bell from this angle. Just a little. Things get red hot as all the windows are shuttered, turning the room into an oven and sending everyone into a panic, especially Amanda, who has burn scars on her neck. Zoe finally realizes that the key to their escape is in the coasters. When all of them are pressed down, a shaft in the wall opens. Up. With everyone else needing to
to manually depress the buttons, Jason volunteers slash demands he goes in first to see what's up. He finds a way out, but as the others follow him into the vent, they run into a logistical problem with the coasters. I feel like we're avoiding the inevitable conclusion here. We're running out of hands. Once again, Zoe comes to the rescue, realizing that with a little bit of water weight, they can keep the buttons down hands-free. Zoe climbs in to help Amanda, who's having a hard time here thanks to some PTSD from her time in Iraq. We see her messed up in a flashback that shows one soldier dead in the background. Danny and Ben start filling glasses to weigh down the coasters, but when they're short a few ounces and the ceiling's broiler comes on, Ben has to use the rest of his flask stash to get them out of there, right before the lobby is incinerated, receptionist and all. The puzzlers wind up in a new cabin-looking room, with all of them rightly pissed except Danny, who somehow still thinks this is part of the experience. Amanda tries to quit to the cameras watching them and call the police on Danny's backup phone, but with no response or any cell service, they're shit out of luck and stuck. Uh, back to escaping rooms, I guess. I'd love to know how interesting this movie is for people who don't do escape rooms, because as a major fan of them, it's actually entertaining for me to watch the characters try to figure out clues. An embroidered song lyric and some reindeer skulls cause Ben to flashback to a time when he drunkenly crashed his car, killing the four friends he was driving and cutting short their Christmas carol. You'll go down in his Rough thing to reflect on, but at least it gives them an answer they need. The combination to this door lock is Rudolph. Ha, <laughs> that was easy. Like Monopoly. They leave the cabin and find themselves in a winter wonderland. Dumb question. Are we outside? Not quite, Mike. There's a pissed off wall in this here room, and it is ready to vent. An inverse of their previous danger, they now find themselves the victims of dropping temperatures, with only one coat provided for the lot of them. This Narnia-esque ice room was the biggest set of the film, and the most challenging to shoot in due to a slippery floor and that hazy gas, which required crew members to wear respirator masks. As Amanda begins a rotational sharing system with the coat, Mike finds a fishing rod, and Zoe grabs a magnet out of a bear's mouth. You know, as you do. They drop line through an ice hole into some water that proves very deep indeed. They pull up a key, yay, frozen inside a block of ice. Boo. And the only one among them with a source of fire is grimy Ben. Ew. Ben snidely throws the lighter at them, and when Danny goes to retrieve it, he falls straight through the ice. A current drags the kid away, and the others are unable to retrieve him before he drowns, becoming the first victim of this deadly escape room and the first non-flashback kill on our count. The others yell at Ben for the assholish way he threw his lighter, but Jason's not one to linger on the past. He knows they have to melt this ice block with their body heat if they have any hope of escaping this room. They incubate that baby while Jason has flashbacks to a similarly freezing incident from his past. Eventually, they get the key free and use it to progress to room number three, just in time too, since this room looks like it was done playing with them anyway. This new room is a pool hall, which isn't hot or cold, it's just upside down. Aw oh, man. Man, how are you supposed to call your shots when the balls ain't even following gravity? By this point in the movie, it's impossible not to be impressed by the set design. Each and every room has a ridiculous amount of detail and feels like a real place. This isn't about like torturous devices on people's bodies and stuff. This is like a living, breathing space that's gonna change when the characters interact with it. The practical sets, which gave the actors a lot to work off of, were put together by an amazing construction team and art department, all working under the direction of production design designer Ed Thomas. Thomas's design is the best part of this film, so I'm glad he's returning for the upcoming sequel. The speakers start blaring Petula Clark's Downtown, aka Juliet's introduction song, and right after Mike realizes that the pool table's missing the eight ball, the room's like, yeah, well, maybe I'm also missing the floor. A very high stakes game of The Floor is Lava begins, and Amanda rises to the occasion, climbing her way like a badass up, up, and behind the bar on the ceiling. Deborah Ann Wall did a lot of these stunts on her own while wearing a safety harness. She and the other cast members trained for this sequence's eight-day shoot under stunt coordinator Grant Tully, who also helped Danny's actor Nick Dodani for his death scene, as Dodani had never swum before. Amanda finds a lockbox, but without Al Gore and his expertise around, they resort to brute force. Try one, two, three, four, just to see. Sorry, Mike, this puzzle ain't your dad's Wi-Fi network. Zoe realizes there's a sliding puzzle on the wall, so she makes her way over and starts to solve it. Better hurry there, Z. This floor is sick of being a floor. She 
solves it to reveal a combination based on billiard balls, but despite their best efforts to work together, the room keeps falling apart like it were brittle hollow. Zoe nearly falls down the floor shaft, but instead survives the present danger while enduring past trauma. A flashback shows a time when her parents and at least one other person were killed in a plane accident. This room's all about evoking loss, huh? Jason helps Zoe back up, and as the camera has spun with this room's perspective, Amanda cracks the code into the lockbox. Inside is the eight ball they need to advance, but to take it to the others, Amanda will have to get over this golf. Damn it, Minos, Amanda already put her time in at the golf. She's able to ninja warrior across, but when the eight ball falls from her pocket, she chooses to drop down and retrieve it to make sure the others can escape. After tossing it up to Jason, the final floor panel drops out. Amanda's only able to prolong the inevitable momentarily, before falling to her presumable death down an endlessly long chasm. <laughs> Oh, no, it wasn't endless. She definitely hid an end down there. The four surviving contestants move into the next room, which has a door marked triage, because this one's themed like a hospital. And not just any hospital, either. This is my room. All of the players, in fact, recognize their own hospital rooms from the past recreated here. Their medical files are present as well, as is Amanda's, inside this section dressed up like a war tent. They read that Amanda was the only survivor of an IED blast in Iraq. That means she had a similar experience to Zoe, who was the only survivor of the plane crash that killed her parents. Jason was the only survivor of a boat accident after his roommate swam away, confused by hypothermia. Ben was the only one who lived through that drunken sleigh accident, and finally Mike was the only survivor of a mineshaft cave-in shown in a flashback. He says it killed 10 people, but we only see one body here. And since we never met the other miners as characters, I'm not gonna put them on the list. Sorry. These revelations show what the six players have in common. We're sole survivors. So what? We're a statistical improbability. And now they want to see who will be the luckiest among the lucky. The theme of trauma was added by Maria Melnick, who co-wrote the screenplay alongside Bragi Shoot, who came up with the initial idea. This is one of those movies put together by producers, such as Ori Marmer and Neil H. Moritz. Director Adam Robitel wasn't brought in until later, although he did make the movie his own during the 43-day shoot in Cape Town. This was Robitel's third time at the helm, after two previous horror films, The Taking of Deborah Logan and Insidious The Last Key. Whoever Whoever recruited these players knew enough about their histories to sprinkle in specific details. The dangers of each room were also tailored to their tragedies. The waiting room's incineration was similar to Amanda's IED experience, the freezing cold ice room mimicked Jason's bout with hypothermia, and the danger of the upside down billiard room was gravity, the same force of nature that killed Zoe's parents. Zoe finds Danny's file and sees he was the only member of his family who survived a carbon monoxide incident. That's why this room's got tanks of poison gas, and they'll unlock mode as soon as this timer runs out. The guys begin scurrying for clues again, while Zoe scurries for a metal bar to bust out the cameras watching them. A sign language clue leads them to EKG, so they strap one up to Ben in hopes that his heart rate will open the door. When it appears to be too low, they hook it up to Mike, but his ticker ain't tub thumping enough either. Jason gets the idea to paddle Mike's chest like a medic in Battlefield 2, even though in real life, defibrillators stop your heart, not make it beat faster. The plan succeeds in getting Mike's heart rate up, but he's not good to go or get back to the fight. He's dead, in fact, which is a real damn shame. Mike was an unassuming character who ended up being my favorite of the bunch. Tyler Levine is just that likable. The doors still haven't opened, and as the gas starts spewing, Jason realizes they might need to register a really low heart rate as well. He diodes himself up and meditates or some shit until his heart rate goes sub-50, which opens up the next door. He wastes no time escaping, but Zoe's not interested in following. She's determined to bring down the police state in instead, so she stays behind as Ben moves on without her. Damn, Zoster, that's a good way to get foamy mouth. Ben and Jason find themselves in a room ripped straight from an art exhibit, with fingerprint-looking wallpaper and a static -y screen casting shadows on them. Ben calls out Jason's callousness and sleuths out that his friend didn't just swim away in a daze. He was actually drowned and killed by Jason, so he could survive using the only jacket they had. Surviving is a choice! Make yours! Yeah, up yours! Er, wait, he said make yours. They find a hatch on the floor and open it to reveal Marcellus Wallace's soul inside! Glowy! And yo, man, souls are trippy as fuck! Turns out the hatch door was smeared with some kind of poisonous hallucinogen, matching Ben's inebriated state during his accident and making it difficult right now to read the next clue. Feel free to leave. But may we know it's best to finally... 
Escape Room has already shown off its production design and creative rooms, but now it's got me impressed by the stylistic shift to show the drug effects. Very awesome. Ben finds an antidote that's only good for one dose, and y'all better close your eyes if flashing lights bother you, because when Jason sees that he has it, the ensuing fight is a strobey rockin' affair. Things get pretty confusing as the actors spin around on a giant lazy Susan. As you might have bet, Jason gets the antidote in the end, so I guess that means that he- oh shit, never mind, that dude's dead now. His head cracked open after Ben tackled him into a wall. Jason was a character we've seen plenty of times before, asshole alpha in a group survivor situation, but I will say Jay Ellis was effective in the role. Ben gives himself the good stuff and drops into the movie's cold open, which was a mostly unnecessary non-linear bit of storytelling. Director Robitel confirmed that it was simply to set the tone, and it replaced an alternate opening that showed a Spanish football team failing to pass the first room. Glad they didn't go with that one. It spoils way too much of the waiting room section, and would have made the later scene there a lot less interesting. As Ben faces down those trash compactor walls, we briefly check back in with Zoe, who's still passed out in the hospital room. Some people in hazmat suits enter and note that she was reaching for an oxygen mask. What the hell was she gonna do with that? Breathe, bitch! <laughs> Zoe beats them down, but I won't count them as kills, cause she doesn't use this gun to double tap them before she leaves. In the game room, Ben's nearly crushed to death, mimicking how Mike almost died during the mineshaft collapse. Ben survives the narrowing walls by hiding in a fireplace with a shield. Oh, what a night. He ends up in a large warehouse with a bunch of film equipment and a viewing station, then hears the voice of the games master telling him he's won, which was not the expected outcome. Did you ever think you had that in you? That adrenaline, that drive? This unassuming feller is Wu Tan Yu, the games master, and he compares what he's doing here to gladiator games and public executions, a way to watch people die for entertainment. Could have just made a YouTube channel, bruh. His clients, the viewers, are the Illuminati type leaders of the world, who are always looking for new groups of people to play their murder games. The theme for this year's contestants was sole survivors of tragic accidents. They wanted to know if luck had anything to do with it. Whether it did or didn't, Ben was this game's winner, so naturally, he asks if he can please go home now, please. At the end of the Kentucky Derby, do you think the horse got surprised? Well, they don't just strangle the horse behind the racetrack, dick. Pretty sure they're sold for breeding or as riding horses. During this scuffle, the games master's screens are hacked, and he shows up on him, labeled as a contestant in play. So you might want to dodge these bullets, dude. Getting shot ain't a winning strategy. This fight with the newly invigorated Zoe, which Taylor Russell plays quite convincingly, includes fun stuff like couch tackling and bottle breaking. Ultimately, Ben kills the games master by shooting him a couple of times just off screen. Though we do see the body for full confirmation. Good work, kids. You two are real winners. They escape the building together, and perhaps perhaps unexpectedly, actually get away. Like to the point where Ben gets medical help and Zoe talks to the police. But their subsequent search of the Minos building reveals that it's abandoned, with no elaborate series of escape rooms. The cops say they've found no evidence for anything Zoe said, but that doesn't stop her from putting together more clues. She realizes that No Way Out is not only where Mick Foley lost his retirement match, but is also an anagram for Wu Tan Yu. Six months later, Zoe and Ben are getting coffee when she reveals that she's been up to some fact-finding. Apparently, the bodies of Mike, Jason, Danny, and Amanda were all found and reported as products of fatal accidents. Ben wants to leave the experience in the past and live his life, but Zoe wants to punish the people who put them through it all. She shows him that she's deconstructed Minos' company logo and discovered some coordinates leading to an industrial building in Manhattan. Best pack an overnight bag, Benny, my boy, because Zoe's already bought plane tickets for the both of you. Ben reluctantly agrees to go with her, and then we cut to a plane with an engine on fire. The flight attendants on board are in a familiar looking situation, searching frantically for clues and trying to open locked doors. They finally break into the cockpit and find that the plane is on a crash course with that mountain right now. You gonna be able to pull up in time, lady? Ending Sam! Never mind, no need to. This was all a game. Or rather, a run through, complete with play testers. This newest escape room is currently in its development stage, and tests have shown it has a 4% chance of survival. The movie ends with us realizing it's slated for Zoe and Ben, and hoping that they'll once again be able to beat the odds. How many people didn't manage to escape this movie alive? Let's find out and get to the numbers. What? Oh, fuck. Uh, uh, uh. Oh, God. Oh, Lucy, get down from there! Oh, oh, oh. oh. She's okay. Come on, Lucy, let's go to the numbers. Oh wait, maybe this way now, huh?
Fifteen people died in escape room and various traps and flashbacks. Nine of the victims were men, four were women, and two were unknown, giving us this puzzling pie chart we'll have to decipher. Oh, wait, never mind. I get it. With a runtime of 100 minutes, that left us with a kill on average every 6.67 minutes. I'll give the golden chainsaw for coolest kill to Jason. Not just because it was the most violent, or because it meant the end of the scary asshole character, but because of the entire fun, trippy sequence it capped off. Dome Machete for lamest kill will go to Mike, because while we knew everyone was gonna die one by one, it was sad to lose him in such a lackluster way. And that's it! Escape Room came out in 2019, and a sequel was due out in just a couple of months on July 16th. As always, I'll look at that after it's out on Blu-ray. Until then, I'm James A. Janice. This has been the Kill Count. On the next Kill Count, we've made it through the night. Beat them or burn them, they go up pretty easy. We've survived a deadly dawn. Holy shit. It's finally time for a brand new day. Though, come to think of it, what's the point? By Day of the Dead, the dead have taken over and human survivors are scarce. We're in the minority now, something like 400,000 to one by my calculations. A group of scientists are running experiments on zombies, but the soldiers watching over them are running out of patience. I'm running this monkey farm now, Frankenstein, and I want to know what the fuck you're doing with my time! As things grow more dire, their philosophical clash threatens to turn violent. This is a great big 14-mile tombstone! Day of the Dead is dark and contemplative. You can just sit there in the dark, think about what you've done. And takes place almost entirely underground. It's excellent for anyone wanting to discuss human nature during a zombie apocalypse. Think about it. I came down here to get drunk. I don't have the energy. And for anyone who wants real, Nasty gore. Because that's in here too. Don't worry. Not that YouTube will let us show any of it. Keep it up. And I'll shove that bottle of yours right up your wise ass. This week, watch the final film in Romero's original trilogy, Day of the Dead. And this Friday, watch the kill count on Dead Meat. I've got better things to do than listen to this kindergarten. Are we finished here? Day of the Dead can currently be watched on the pictured streaming platforms. Dead Meat always recommends you watch the movie for yourself before it's kill count. It's the only way to have your own properly informed opinion. Kill counts are never meant to replace the experience of watching a film. Thanks a lot for watching this extra kill count. I want to thank some patrons like Gabrielle Mahan, Quinn Riley, Paul Sell, Ramon Rosario, Mario, Genevieve, and Lou Irving. I hope you've been enjoying these extra Sunday kill counts. I have another one next week, but it's for Zorin's music video, Social Media Asicus 2. And then in June, we're back down to one a week, so I can, you know, sleep. But June will see the premiere of Zorin's brand new series, They Talk. So keep an eye out for that one, all right? Thanks, everyone. Be good people.